So we have talking um, about a couple of points before we've really hit the math portion of this lecture. And one of these topics was the definition of precision and accuracy. And here I think in the PowerPoint does a very good job of determining the difference between precision and accuracy. So on a test, uh, you know, if this was a pencil and paper test, you could have drawn the bullseye and the, and the darts to uh, point or to prove your point. Uh, but it's a little more difficult to do in Blackboard in an online class. So if you want to describe a dartboard and what the dartboard is trying to tell us, you're more than welcome to do so if it asks you to define precision and accuracy. But here we basically see up at the very top, this is good precision and this is good accuracy. So good precision means that all of your darts are really close together, that you can replicate your throw every single time. And good accuracy basically means that you can hit the bullseye, and this is the true value. So good precision and good accuracy, they are completely different, and they do not have to relate to each other. So for instance, I could get a lab analyst in working with the company, and they could have really good precision, meaning they could reproduce their result every single time without a problem. However, that result might not be accurate. So here we see a group of darts that are here on the dartboard that's very far away from the bullseye in the center. This represents good precision, but it represents bad accuracy. And then finally, down here below, this is our third set, and this is an employee that you do not want. You want to stay away from this type of employee because they just can't really do anything at all. And they can't really hit the bullseye, they can't really reproduce their results, so they're all over the place. This is someone that's drunk at the bar. Don't get near them, especially with a handful of darts. So this is what we need to kind of think about when we are in the laboratory, when we're doing testing, when we're reporting results, you know, how reliable is the data? And we're looking for good precision and good accuracy. At the same time, we've also talked about the different types of errors. We said that no one's really perfect, and there are ways that we can get around that, and there's ways that we can fix that to make our numbers a little more reasonable or to make us feel better about the data that we are producing from the company itself. And these two different types of errors are called systematic and random. So systematic errors are what we call determinate errors, and random errors are what we call indeterminate. So they go by both terms, and we've discussed this already as well in a previous video. So systematic, they're called determinate. Well, they're called determinate because they're very easy to determine where they happen. So we know that there's a, maybe a mistake in the method that we're following, and that mistake we have picked up on. We've done that mistake every single time. So in the end, it kind of washes out, but there's something there that we can pinpoint and we can say, this is the problem, we know what's happened. Random error is a little different. Random is harder sometimes to pick up on, especially if it's truly random. So this is why we call it indeterminate. Uh, it's inconclusive where the error could have been. It could have been here, or it could have been there, or it could have been here. So if you're doing a melting point and you're providing a melting point to me, and that melting point is off, there's a couple of reasons that it could be off. Well, this is stuff that we kind of make up. I don't want to call it making it up, but I want to call it maybe excuses. What excuses could you give me on why that melting point is not spot on textbook value? So these could be random errors that were associated with the lab procedure itself. And a lot of times these are hard to pick up on, and we said in a previous video that we fix this by the use of statistics, and that is the purpose of this next section. It is statistics. So with the systematic error, we've talked about it, we've discussed it, and there's ways that we can fix systematic error or things that we have to bring into play. And number one is we analyze what we call a known standard. This allows us to determine if the method that we're doing, if the procedure that we're doing, if you as a analyst can do the job. So what we do is that we order a standard, a reference material from an unknown or from a known company, 
and we give it to you as an unknown. So this is part of quality assurance and quality control. Uh, two companies that we can order from, one of these is called NIST and NIST standard and NIST represents the National Institute of Science and Technology and ASTM is the American Society for Testing and Materials. These two companies have at their disposal tons of different products and these products all have a certain concentration of maybe something that I'm looking for. So for instance, let's say that my job is to extract the cholesterol from an egg. All right, well, how much cholesterol is in the egg? In order for me to feel good about what I'm doing, I would probably want to order a standard. Something that I know for sure that's very similar to an egg, if not an egg itself, and exactly how much cholesterol there is in that sample. The same way goes for a piece of coal. Let's say that I'm looking for the amount of sulfur. I can call NIST up or ASTM up, tell them what I'm doing, and they will probably have on hand a piece of coal with a certain amount of sulfur that they know and they will ship me this sample and then I can process this sample and do my lab procedure or my SOP. Well hopefully at the end of this process my numbers come out really close to what the accepted numbers are supposed to be and that is the purpose of NIST or ASTM. They are companies that I order reference materials from. I know how much is in that sample so therefore when I do it I should be getting the same values that they got. Uh, they often have this thing called SRMs. SRM stand for Standard Reference Materials and these are typically used for calibration standards. So I'll order this standard, I maybe dilute it down or I use it in a different way, I make my calibration curve from it and this is what I will begin to process all of my samples against from that point on. All of these things have to have a certificate and this is called a COA and this certificate basically is your legal piece of paper that says we as a company NIST or ASTM are providing you this sample with this amount of analyte in it. We have tested this analyte, we know how much is supposed to be there, so therefore here is a certificate that you can follow away proving that we are standing by our standard reference materials. So this is called a Certificate of Analysis, COA. It's a document. Typically it looks like a certificate that you would frame on a wall. If you had some maybe some kids in elementary school that won an award, it kind of looks like that. And this you keep on file just in case regulators like the EPA or FDA come down and take a look at some of the data that's being generated by the laboratory. So it tells us the purity and it tells us the quality of the samples that we're using. Okay, uh, There's a couple of ways also to detect systematic error before we start talking about the math. Right, Systematic is something that happens over and over. So we very often analyze blanks in the laboratory and when we analyze blanks that basically means no analyte should be found at all and our readings should be zero on the instrumentation. So we want to constantly read a blank throughout the procedure that we're doing and hopefully we'll get zeros across the board every time that we run them. We also use different methods. Uh, I could assign one analyst one method to detect bromine concentration. Then I could go over to someone else and have them to detect bromine concentration by a completely different lab experiment. And if it's the same sample, 
both people should come to me with the same values at the end. So I should be getting the same story no matter the type of method that is used. So they should all agree. That is one way that we can determine systematic error. Is there an error associated with the procedure itself? And number four is what we call round robin. Different people in several labs analyzing samples by the same and different methods. So we call this round robin because, you know, there's just so many things that are going on. I've got a handful of people that are doing the same exact experiment maybe in my laboratory, and then I'm calling a laboratory across the country, and I'm having them do the same method in their lab facility, and different people will be doing it. And then we combine that data and we look at it and again hopefully it's telling us the same thing. If not we've got to figure out where the problem is at. With random error we said it was a little harder. It cannot typically be found very easily and uh, these are simple little mistakes that you might do that could not get recorded. So for instance, if I'm using a volumetric flask and I go over the line on the volumetric flask a little bit and let's say that I didn't catch it and I didn't write that down, that is a random error that's now been associated with my measurements. So these are things much harder, but statistics are able to fix those problems for us. So statistics are for random errors. Statistics do not help with systematic because we said systematic errors happen over and over and over every single time. So that very last statement is very important, right? So statistics is only for random measurements and that is it. So there's a couple of things that we're going to be talking about as far as statistics are concerned. Some of these you're going to be familiar with, some of these are going to be brand new for you. And the very first one that we're going to look at is this term called a mean. Mean, a.k.a. is average. So if you know how to do an average with a set of numbers, you will be okay with this because we treat it no differently. We treat it no differently than math people do. We treat it no differently than when you learned it maybe in elementary school. So we're going to talk about a mean. We're going to revisit it, talk about how to calculate it. And then I'll show you how to do that in Excel because it's very important. We're then going to look at the word median. How is that different? We're going to look at the word standard deviation. And from that, it's also going to be relative standard deviation. So these are just a couple of terms that we're going to be looking at before we go on and talk about the more advanced topics in statistics that we will need as well. So stay tuned. The math is coming up in the next video and hopefully the mean won't cause you any problems.